So my name is Sia Bongazwane. You feel free to call me Sia. I'm a tutor for 1501 Basic Psychology. The human nervous system, structure and function. He, he, last week, on, on Saturday, on our first class, we discussed human nervous system and we focused on the neurons. The first part of, of human nervous system, the neurons. Human nervous system is one of the broad chapters for this module. So you need, in order for you to master this module, you need to make sure that you start by understanding the first class, the first chapter, that is human nervous system, particularly specialized in, specializing in impulse conduction in the neuron. So last week we did impulse conduction in the neuron. So today we're going to do the structure and function, the structure and function. In short, just to sum it up, last week the, the main topic where the neurons, the function of neurons, we discussed the neurons, we said the neurons are one of the key functions of the neurons. They help to transport information from one place to another. They facilitate information. Neurons are more like a structure that facilitates that facilitate information. However, how does that happen? How does they go? That's where the structure and functions comes in. The structure and fu the function, particularly of the body, brain, spinal cord. So we can start. This is the first key point. The nervous system, the relationship between central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system. For you to master nervous system, you need to know firstly that you have the what you call central nervous system. Of which you will find in your study guide in the recommended book, the central nervous system. So oh, let me read this. They say the part of the neuron system, the part of the nervous system, individuals, individual and working together are responsible for various aspects of behavior. However, it is important to keep in mind that this is the only one way of describing behavior. There are other viewpoints. Let me repeat. The part of nervous system, individually or working together, are responsible for various aspects of behavior. However, it is important to keep in mind that this is the only way to describe the behavior. There are other viewpoints, such as looking at the contribution of thoughts, social, social experiences in shaping our behavior. So I'm reading from the recommended book, the green one, which is called The Student A to Z. So you can consult the book because it has some additional information, some examples. It's much easier to use. The human nervous system is, they say, the human nervous system is a very complex com communication system that functions in a high organized integrated way. In order to get an overview of this system, it is necessary to classify the, to classify its components. What are those components? That's where central nervous system, system comes into play. What is central nervous system? So the question in mind will be, what is central nervous system? The concept central, what does it mean? Central, most of the time, you think of primary, if not pr primary, something that is central, the, the key point, the center of information. The center of information. What's the center of information? Brain and spinal cord. For us to transport information, for us to, to hear, to interpret, we need the brain and spinal cord. So these are the two keys for information. Imagine that you don't have a brain. Imagine that your, your spinal cord gets hurt or damaged, meaning there won't be information processing. If the spinal cord is damaged and certain nerves neurons that surround the spinal damage, certain parts of your, of your body won't function, certain muscle will be disabled. That is central nervous system, the central part of the motor co coordination, transportation of information. 
they say brain and spinal cord, which acts as a central control room that sends and receives message to and from the body and the outside world. They say the brain and the spinal cord, you see the circle. They work together, which acts as a central control room that sends and receives messages to and from the body and outside body. That is the brain and spinal cord. Its responsibility is to send information from the inside as well as they say the outside body. They are working and we will describe that as we, we go on. Then you have the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, which has to do with neuron and organs. The, the neurons and organs, we have somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. Somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. Neurons and organs. This is brain and spinal cords. Peripheral has to do with the neurons and organs. Let's go to the next slide and break it down. The key spinal cord. Firstly, before we discuss the functions, the key factors under spinal cord. Let's look at this, the, the, the spinal nerve. The spinal cord consists of the spinal nerves. What are the spinal nerves? They say the spinal cord is made up of the columns of white matter. That is, bundle of exons covered with myelin. They form nerves. 30 pairs of nerves surrounding the spinal cord and each nerve divides into what you call a motor and sensory root. root. Let's refer to your spinal nerves. Spinal, spinal, spinal nerves are are more like wires. They say the bundle of wires or exons that cover the, the spinal cord. For us to send information, we don't only need the brain and spinal cord, but around the spinal cord, this is the spinal cord. This is the front part of the spinal cord. So around the spinal cord, as well as the inside here, you'll find the nerves. The nerves which are responsible to transport information. So the information is not transport, it's transported just through the bone, but the nerves are responsible, the neurons. So imagine the pole, electric pole. Inside the electric pole, there are wires that assist in transporting electricity. So let's assume this is a pole, electricity pole. Inside the pole, there are wires that transports electricity. When you switch off the light, you get the electricity. When you switch on off the light, you won't get electricity. So same applies to the, the spinal cord. You need a, a, stimula, a stimuli, something that to stimulate the, the neurons, the nerves, in order to transport information from in and out. They say the spinal cord is made up of the columns of white matter, that is, the bundle of exons covered with the myelin. Remember, the exons are part of the neurons. So the spinal cord is made up of white, of the of columns of white matter. That is, bundle of exons covered with myelin. If the exons, remember, are covered with myelin, they'll transport information fast. If the exon or the neuron are covered with myelin, they transport the information fast. They say they form nerves. Get a pair of nerves surrounding the spinal cord. There are 30 pairs of nerves surrounding the spinal cord. Each nerve divides into a motor and sensory. They say each nerve divides into two. Then we have a, a motor and sensory. Then they say, see the figure below. What is sensory? What is motor? Sensory fibers, fibers carry the message to the spinal cord. They say sensory fibers carry the message to the spinal cord. Whereas motor fibers sends a message to, to the muscles to respond. First contact, contact of information. As I'm talking to right now, you are receiving what? The sound waves. You can also see the slice, the color. A brownish, chocolate, black, reddish, blue, black. You can differentiate the color. You can hear my voice, my voice waves. 
which part is responsible for that is sensory. Sensory, they say sensory fibers carry the message to the spinal cord. Sensory is the receiving part of the neuron. Remember, neurons have dendrites. The first contact with information, as I'm talking to you, you receive the information through the neurons. Which part of the neurons? The dendrites. So that part of the neuron, you can sum it up and say, is sensor, sensory. We receive the information through sensory. Sensory fibers carry the message to the spinal cord. Then it moves along the same. Motor fibers send the message to the muscles to respond. Then motor fibers send the message to the muscle to respond. I'm talking to you, I say to you, let's assume that, let's write an activity. Let's write an activity, or I'm busy moving my mouse. Also, your eyes will follow. I change the slides, also your eyes will follow. That is motor fiber. They send a message to the muscle. They tell you to respond. You receive information from your mind. That is number one. From your mind, it's interpreted. Once the, the information is interpreted, like I've said, from your mind is via the spinal cord. Sensory fiber carry messages to the spinal cord. From where? To, from the brain. Sensory fiber carry the messages to the spinal cord. So where does the information come from? It comes from the brain. Sensory fibers carry the message to the spinal cord, which comes from the brain. Then it moves along. Then motor fibers sends the message to the muscle, the muscle to respond. When you say the muscle to respond, like I said, I give an activity that you need to write. You start moving your hands, you write. I'm moving my mouse, also your eyes will move. You're trying to make sense of the information. Those, is the those are muscle movements muscle movements, your, the interaction, I make you to move through the slides. Then you, 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 we have this, which is called interneurons in the spinal cord relay the message to the motor fiber. They say they relay the message to the motor fiber. Information from the brain, from information from the brain, as I'm talking to you right now, then sensory fibers carry the message to the spinal cord for you to respond. How do you respond through motor fiber? They say motor fiber sends a message to the muscle to respond. Before that happens, there is inter neuron in the spinal cord acts as a relay station. Before the, inf the information moves to the motor fiber, this is a relay station. So normally what the relay station does is a relay station acts as a station. Remember station from platform to platform. Uh, let's assume that the train is moving. From Sentin, yeah, let's imagine how train, how train moves Sentin, Midrand, Kempton Park. It acts as a relay station, determines the information that needs to pass through. It coordinates the information, not determines, it coordinates the information that needs to pass, pass through. In time, you run the spinal cord to relay the message to the motor fiber. Relay the message to the motor fiber. It doesn't go straight to motor fiber, but it determines. It, it coordinates it to the motor fiber. That's the spinal cord. Then they say it reflexes. The spinal cord carry information to and from the body by producing basic forms of behavior. The spinal cord carry information to and from the body by producing basic forms of behavior. Number one, how does it carry information? It carries information through the nerves. It carries information through the nerves. These are nerves, the sensory, the motor, the interneuron. The spinal cord carries information to and from the body by producing basic forms of behavior. Let's assume right now that you, you touch a, a burning substance, you touch a, a stove, a burning substance, Automatically, you remove your, your hand quick. It says it's reflexive. You receive, you remove your hand quick because you'll get bent. By the tip of your fingers, you touch the stove. Suddenly, you remove your hand, your hand quick. That is reflexes. Reflexes is a quick reaction, something that you cannot control. The spinal cord carries information too and from the body by producing a basic forms of 
behavior. The behavior is called reflexes. A reflex is a, is a simple stereotype, stereotype response that follows immediately after a certain stimuli is received. A reflex is a simple stereotype response that follows immediately after a certain stimulus is received. Like I said last week, we are walking in the street, suddenly you hear the gunshots. As soon as you hear the gunshots, your mind switches on. You turn around, you look for a gunshot because you know that the gunshots could be dangerous. So reflexively, instantly, you respond. How do you respond? Respond reflexively. By reflexively, it means you you do it unconsciously. You do it unconsciously because it, it can hurt you. Like assuming you touch a hot place stove, suddenly you feel the heat. You touch a hot place stove, suddenly you feel it. Reflexes, you move away from the stove. I come next to you, I pinch you. You respond through through pain, it's reflexes, it's something that you cannot control. You, you are eating, suddenly food sh shocks you, you respond. How do you respond? By coughing out the food. It's reflexive, something that you cannot control. They say a reflex is a, is a, is a simple stereotype response that follows immediately after a certain stimulus is received. After a certain stimulus is received. Okay, let's move on. I think we are covered spinal nerves. What you need to know here that you have spinal cord. Spinal cord, they are nerves that assist in transporting the information. We have sensory which receives information and take it, it receives information from the brain and transport it to the spinal cord. Then you have motor fibers which takes information from the spinal cord to the muscles to respond. Before this process happens, we have the interneuron, which is interneuron in the spinal cord relay, relay message to motor fiber. How does this relay message, like I said, it coordinates message messages. Remember that we have five senses, five senses, which is taste, hearing, visual, touch, as well as, we said taste, Visual, hearing, touch, I forgot one. Okay, it will come to my mind. That's where relay, relay station, let's say you sing something. Like now you sing the the, the slide and uh, moving the mouth. It's, it's transported to the spinal cord. From the spinal cord, you need, like it, it, it is determined. Is it a visual message? Auditory hearing? Is it smell? Is it touch? Taste? Then it's coordinated. Interneuron is a spinal cord relay message to the motor fiber. Relay appropriate message to the motor fiber. How does this happen? It's happened through reflexes. Reflexes, something that you cannot control. It's beyond our imagination. It's, it happens automatically. Then you have what you call the central nervous system. The central nervous system, you are continuing the central nervous system the relationship between the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is protected by bones called skull. This is a skull. Some they say this is the thickest bone in the body. The brain is, is protected by the skull. This is your brain. This is your skull. It's protected. Then spinal cord. The spinal cord is protected by bones of the spinal column called vertebrae or three membrane. The spinal cord is protected by bones of the spinal column called vertebrae. And the three membranes, that is the outer membrane called rameta, which is very strong and thick. Then you have the middle membrane called arachnoid, which is thick but more flexible. Then we have the inner membrane called pimeter, which is soft and flexible. Okay, let's start afresh. The brain is protected by skull, whereas the spinal cord is protected by 
by bones of the spinal column. The, 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 the bones of the spinal column are called vertebrae and the three membranes. That is the outer meter. Let's check the outer meter, which is called the jura meter. I hope you can see. This is the jura meter. Jura meter. They say it is very strong. Take into mind that the, the spinal cord is flexible. It needs to move around. Whether you are dancing, you are bending, you are exercising, the spinal cord needs to move around. Imagine if it was connected by, bone by bone. Yes, these are bones, but in between the bones, that's where you'll find these matters, the pure matter, the arachnoid, to protect them so that there won't be any sensitivity. So it's not a bone connected to a bone. However, in between the attention, the, the muscles, to avoid irritation, is not a bone to bone, but it is bone to bone. However, in between, to make the smooth movements, that's where you find what you say, can say, we can say cartilage, this matters, this membrane to protect the smooth movement. That is outer, outer, outer membrane is protected by jura meter, which is strong and thick. Strong and thick, so that, that's an outside. The middle membrane called arachnoid, which is thick but more flexible, is thick but more flexible, which allows what? The movement, the swift movement of the spinal cord. Then the last one, the inner membrane. The inner membrane, they say soft and flexible. Soft and flexible, that's where you find most of the, of the neuron, the nerves. So the bone also needs to be soft and flexible, so it won't damage the nerves. Because the nerves are sensitive. The nerves are sensitive, they are tiny fiber, a tiny nerves, which are sensitive as well. Hence, hence the, the inner membrane is soft and flexible. So again, so that it won't affect the neurons. Moving on. So in short, skull is the brain is protected by skull, spinal cord is protected, protected by vertebrae, the three membranes. Then you name the three membranes, jura meter, arachnoid, pi meter. You need to know which membrane is inside, which one is the outside. You know that the jura meter is the outer, is the outer, mem outer membrane, which is very strong and thick. Then you have the inner, the middle membrane, which is arachnoid, which is thick, however, more flexible. The inner membrane, which is, is pimeta, which is soft and flexible. We have discussed the key factors. Number one, the brain and spinal cord, the central nervous system, the movement, how does it relate to the neurons? The brain, I hope you can see the brain. Now we are going deep. We spoke about the protection here, but now we are going deep. The structures also of the brain, as well as the functions of the relevant parts of the brain. This is our brain. First, we have the thalamus. We have the thalamus. We have a forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. You can look at the structure in your study guide or the recommended book. We have the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. The forebrain, we have Corpus callosum. This is corpus callosum. We'll explain the function. We have thalamus, hypothalamus, the forebrain. Then the midbrain. This is the midbrain. Around the pons. The hindbrain, we have the pons, cerebellum, medulla oblongata. And let's check the function. They say thalamus. Thalamus acts as a relay station for sensory information. Thalamus acts as a relay station for sensory information. What do they mean by that? Acts as a relay station for sensory information. I'm looking for a broader, a broader term. Thalamus, thalamus. Acts as a relay station. You receive information. Whether through touch, hearing, the information goes straight to where? To your eardrums. Eardrums go straight to the brain. 
then this part of the brain determines where to send the information. Where do we send the information? In appropriate parts of the brain. That is a relay station. Send thalamus. It is a relay station. That's the uh, you receive information. Goes straight to the brain. Brain. Thalamus. Thalamus. Then determines in a quick succession, reflexively. It determines where the sensory information needs to go. In the relevant parts of the brain. Then you have what we call hypothalamus. Hypothalamus regulating the internal environment of the body. Regulates the internal environment of the body. State of sleep, wakefulness, emotions, and what else? Temperature. It regulates temperature. The right temperature you see in your study material. The hypothalamus regulates the internal environment. The internal environment is what you cannot see, but what you can feel. Thing that you cannot see, but you can see, you can observe them through behavior. Temperature. Temperature is number one. When you feel cold, the hypothalamus determines that is cold. From your skin, you feel the coldness. It goes straight to the, the hypothalamus. But before it goes straight to the hypothalamus, like they said, you go outside in the morning, you wake up, you bath, then you decide to go outside with, with just your shirt. As soon as you go outside, you know, you realize you no, know, it's cold. Where do you, your first contact of coldness or where it's, it's too hot is through the skin. The skin will determine whether it's hot or cold. Then it sends the information straight to the brain. Where does it go to the brain? It goes to the thalamus. Then the thalamus will determine, coordinate the information to the right place. Where is the right place? To the hypothalamus. That's where you know whether it's cold. You tell your man that it's cold, then you start to shiver. You go back and, and dress home. If it's too hot, you'll, you'll, you'll dress on appropriate clothes. clothes. That is internal environment, something that you cannot see, but you can feel it in your in your body through the hypothalamus. Determine the state of sleep. You sleeping and waking up is through hypothalamus. So wakefulness is the hypothalamus. Determine the emotion, emotions is hypothalamus. Then we have what you call basal ganglia. Basal ganglia consists of neurons that regulate. Basal ganglia consists of neurons that regulate walking. Working slow and smooth movement. Determined working consists of neurons that regulate working slow movement. So without basal ganglia, your work coordination won't be effective. Is it clear? Then you have limbic system. Limbic system comprises of structures like hippocampus, amalgamia, septum, limbic cortex that regulate motivated behavior, emotions, and memory. Comprises of structures like hippocampus, amalgamia, septum, limbic cortex that regulate motivated behavior. Remember. PYC 101 and PYC 1 is a multiple choice question. So we won't say to you, label the structure. However, you must say explain. And the explanation is through multiple choice question. We give you a definition. For instance, we might say to you, the structure that regulates the internal environment of the body, state of sleep, wakefulness, and emotions. Then the option that we we'll give you is Basal ganglia, limbic, thalamus, and hypothalamus to check if you understand. Then you need to choose an appropriate structure. Here. Then the septum. The septum contains two structures. So, whatever else I'm reading, you'll find in your study guide, you'll find in the recommended book. The septum contains two structures that is superior colicus superior colicus a reflex center for controlling eye blink and the size of the pupil what controls the eye blink and the size of the pupil that is superior colicus a reflex center that controls the eye blink and size of the uh, pupil 
Remember, this is reflexive. They say reflexive because you can't control it. Eye blink, you can't control it. Sneezing, you can't control. So eye blink, the size of your people, is superior colicus. Then you have the inferior colicus. Inferior colicus is a reflex center for hearing by controlling volume. Starkly response to sound. Inferior colicus, a reflex center for hearing by controlling volume. Starkly a response to sound. Segmentum. Segmentum regulates motor movement. Regulates motor movement. Mo motor movement, any physical movement. The motor skills. Moving your muscles, moving your body. They re it regulates motor movement. So their functions are nearly similar to basal ganglia. They say basal ganglia consists of neurons that regulate walking in slow movement. Here they say it, re it regulates motor movement. So when you study, because the, your exam is, is most is multiple choice, you need to, to look at the similarities that's how, the, because that's how we get you as students. You see, both they say motor movement, even here they say smooth movement. However, the difference is, they say here, it consists of neurons that regulate walking and slow movement. Here they don't talk about neurons, they just say it's regulation of motor movement. So know the difference between the two. Consists of neurons that regulate walking slow, smooth movement, it regulates motor movement. On our right hand side, you see here, cerebellum coordinates motor movements. You see movement, movement, movement. So be mindful when you study. Some phrases are, are similar. However, when you read data, you see that there is a difference. Consists of neurons that regulate walking, slow movement, regulates motor movement, coordinates motor, motor movement. That's the difference between gut puzzle, ganglia, segmental, and cerebellum. We, we, during the exam, we choose. The structure in the brain that regulates motor movement. We put cerebellum, segmentum, and basal ganglia. So the only thing that you know by that time is just movement. We are not sure where the basal ganglia segmentum. At times, because we saw motor movement, then quick you 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 answer. You say it is cerebellum. So you check coordinate motor movement, regulate motor motor movement, regulate smooth movement. So when you start, be careful of that. Look at the similarities and the differences. Uh, same applies to hypothalamus. They say hypothalamus regulate the internal, the internal environment of the body. E.g., the, they say emotions. Same applies to limbic system. You see, it determines emotions. Similar. To check those similarities. Then we have what? The medulla oblongata, which is the most important part of the brain. When it's affected, you, you die instantly. It's a reflex center for processes of survival, such as heart rate and breathing. It is a reflex center for processes of survival, such as heart, heart rate and breathing. So there are other parts under the medulla oblongata, other important parts under the medulla oblongata of which you will find the more you study. It acts as a survival skill. It's, it's, a, it's a key function of the body. It's your survival skill. If your material is affected, you die instantly. They say it's an extension of the spinal cord, regulates breathing and heart rates. Then you have what we call pons. Pons regulate sleep and wakefulness. You see, regulate sleep. It's an internal environment that regulates sleep. Sleep. You check the similarities. Sleep and wakefulness. Also, here yeah, sleep and wakefulness. Regulating the entire internal environment of the body. State of sleep and wakefulness. Regulate sleep and wakefulness. Yes, you need to go through your notes. Don't depend on these notes for examination papers. You use these notes as well as your study materials. You compare. Perhaps you can make a printout. Then 
you write next to it. Regular sleep, wakeful sleep and wakefulness, state of sleep and wakefulness. Some part of the brain are common, are similar. Okay, the brain. Cerebral cortex, going deep, the brain. Cerebral cortex is an outer layer of the brain. Which features, which features bumps and grooves. Uh, you, you, you open the structure of your brain, I can see this one is, is not clear. It says cerebral cortex is an outer layer of the brain, which features and bumps. You see, the brain is not smooth. It's an organ that is not smooth. You'll find, they say grooves and pumps. It's not smooth, they are grooves and pump. That's your, your brain. Cerebral cortex, the outer layer of the brain. The outside, what covers the brain? We are not talking about the skull. The skull is something else. But the brain, this organ, is covered by what? Cerebral cortex, the outer layer of the brain, which features there's a bumps and grooves. Then they say cerebral hemisphere connected by the structure called corpus callosum. This is corpus callosum. This is a half of the brain. You see the side. The half of the brain is divided into two. It's connected by what? We have the right brain and the, and the left brain connected by this bone. We call this bone the corpus callosum. Cerebral hemisphere connected by the structure called corpus callosum, the connection between the two brains, left hemisphere as well as the right hemisphere, left and the right hemisphere. What purpose does it serve? The two hemisphere, which purpose does they serve? The left hemisphere is known as a logical and rational thinking. Determines logical and rational thinking. Logical and rational thinking. Whereas the right hemisphere is for creativity. Determines what? Creativity. Logical, rational thinking. Like now we are trying to make sense of what I'm saying. Meaning you're using what? Your logic, mostly your left hemisphere. However, as soon as I show you structures, we go through the structures to make sense of the structures. When I do the notes, I make sure that there's color. That is to enhance your creativity through the right hemisphere. Creative people mostly use their right hemisphere. Those are artists, they use their right hemisphere. Left hemisphere, normally they will make an example that said, when you are dealing with numbers and figures, when you are dealing with objects, when you are playing chess, when you are playing certain games, you need to be a logical thinker. When you write your exam, remember it's multiple choice, you are given four questions. Mostly, we have the, the, the one correct option, the least likely to be correct, and the other two options are totally wrong. You receive four, four answers. You have to receive one question and four responses. Out of, of, of the four responses, two, they are most incorrect. The other two, they are close. So you apply your logical thinking. Normally what you do is, you firstly cancel the most incorrect answers. They give you a question firstly, before you choose the correct answer, unless you know it, you eliminate the most two incorrect answers, then you remain with two. Then you start reading the question again then chances are you'll come up with the, uh, the correct answer. So left hemisphere is logic, reasoning. Right hemisphere is for creativity. But for protection purposes, for protection purposes, the space between the skull and the brain is filled with fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. For protection purposes, the space between the skull and the brain. This is the brain. Then this is the skull. In between, there's something that protects the brain from the skull. Remember, the skull is a, it's a bone. This is an organ, a sensitive organ. It does not need to be attached to the skull. So in between, you'll find what we call 
the fluid, a liquid-like substance. The brain is standalone. From the spinal cord is a standalone connected to the brain. In between, there's water-like substance, liquid-like substance. That liquid-like substance, that liquid-like substance is a cerebrospinal fluid. The fluid push, which is produced by the brain, also protected by blood, brain barriers, blood vessels, and capillaries. Let me start afresh. For protection purposes, the space between the skull and the brain is filled with a fluid. The fluid is called cerebrospinal fluid, produced by the brain, also protected by blood, blood brain barriers, as well as blood vessels called capillaries which are impermeable to many substances that carry important substances like oxygen, glucose to the brain and transport waste products from the brain cells. Let me repeat this part. Blood brain barriers as well as blood vessels called capillaries. The capillaries are impermeable to many substances, meaning it's more like a sponge. However, this type of sponge it does not just filtrate anything, which is impermeable. Certain substances cannot pass through it. Yes, impermeable. Certain substances cannot pass through it. Capillaries, which are impermeable to many substances, certain substances cannot pass through it. What are those many substances? They say that carry important substances. The brain needs important substances like what? Oxygen and glucose. For your brain to be effective, you need oxygen and glucose. That's why when a person shocks you, instantly your brain won't get the oxygen, then you collapse. When you suffocate, when you suffocate, the, the, the tear gas or any harmful substance that you inhale goes straight to your mind, which is, does not, is not needed in your mind. Meaning the capillaries will try to fight it back. However, if it's strong enough, your brain loses oxygen, then there's a side, a side and collapse your brain won't function. Your brain needs oxygen and glucose to function, not any other substance. Any other substance here would mean uh, could be smoking, uh, taking in certain substances to eat. Toxic substances, they should not be impermeable to the brain. They, they are not allowed in the brain. The brain also only needs oxygen and glucose. That's why when you take drugs, they say too much of something, will affect you. When you take drugs, those are the most intoxic substances. They will damage the brain. So what happens here is that many substances, like important substances, like oxygen and glucose to the brain. And what does these capillaries do as well? They say they transport waste products from the brain to the brain, from the brain cells. They take in the nutrition which are more important, they take in the substances which are more important, oxygen and glucose, then take out substances that are not, not needed. They say transport waste products from their brain cells. Okay, let's start afresh. For protection purposes, the space between the skull and the brain, what you find, you find a fluid. The fluid that is called cerebrospinal fluid, produced by what? By the brain. Also protected by blood brain barriers and, and blood vessels called capillaries. What's the, what's the importance of these capillaries? They make sure that there's enough, they make sure that there's enough oxygen and glucose for the brain to function effectively. Then they do what? They transport the waste products out of the brain. That is the, the capillaries. They are the key, they are the most important. They take the harmful substances out of the brain. Hope you are clear. The lobes of the brain, the lobes of the brain, you see the inform this information on the study. Make sure that you don't skip it. Make sure that you don't only focus on, on this information. This is a summary to make things much easier for you. The lobes of the brain, the lobes of the brain, how many lobes do you have? There are four lobes. Occipital lobe, Parietal loop, temporal loop, and frontal loop. This is the frontal loop, the front, the frontal loop, temporary loop, which is below the frontal loop, parietal loop, 
then the occipital loop at your back. The function, the occipital loop, it is a, so it's, a, it's a visual area. The visual area determines what you see. What you see in what way? The color. You see things, you see things through color. It determines color, whether it's light or dark. The distance, occipital loop, the visual, visual area. Then you have the parietal, the parietal loop. The parietal loop, which is body sensation. Body sensation determines pain. Whether something is cold or heat, that's the parietal loop. Then you have what you call the temporal loop. That is an auditory area. Frontal loop, mental activities. Mental activities and behavior. Determines mental activities as well as behavior. Frontal loop. Moving on, I'm going to start off afresh to break it down certain aspects. Then the peripheral loop, the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is divided into what? Two. We have somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. Peripheral nervous system, the start with somatic, it refers to the nerves that conduct information from the sensory receptors in the body to the central nervous system. Somatic refers to the nerves that conduct information that's in the body. Central nervous system. That is sensory, and if you don't call it sensory, then it's afferent nerves. From the central nervous system, to the skeletal muscle. How does this process happen? Is that you receive information through a form of a stimuli. You receive information through a process called a stimuli. There's a refer. A stimuli either could be attached, someone calling your name. Then you receive a message right through your brain. Then what happens in your brain? They say the nerves, the neurons transport the information. Refer somatic nervous system refers to the nerves that conduct information from the sensory receptors. Remember, sensory receptors, the first contact of information. We receive information through sensory receptors in the body to the central nervous system. Central nervous system via the body and mind through the sensory and afferent nerves. And from the central nervous system, that is the brain and spinal cord from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscle in the body. To the skeletal muscles in the body, motor and afferent nerves. The autonomic nervous system controls the process that regulates our internal organs. The autonomic nervous system controls the process that regulates our internal organs, glands, so that the body functions evenly through sympathetic nervous system in parasympathetic nervous system. Why organs? Why glands? We're discussing about the brain, the neurons, and the spinal cord. Suddenly, organs. Why organs? Our body is the most important organs. The brain is part of always number is the first organ that is important. Then the other two organs that we're having, more than two actually, we have the lungs, the heart are organs, meaning you, you receive a shocking news via telephone. You receive shocking news via telephone. It goes straight to your mind through what we call sensory receptors. The sensor receives the information. It takes it straight to central nervous system. From central nervous system, remember it's body and mind. Then you interpret the information. The information is too sad. The information is too overwhelming. What happens to your internal organ? Your heart starts pumping. You are more anxious now. As soon as your heart starts to pump, your breathing rate through the lungs, high rate of breathing. Those are the internal organs. When you see something, when you experience something, you get a shock. Internal organs will move. Heart rate, blood pressure goes high. Those are part of the internal organs. 
Then the glands. What do you mean by glands? The glands stimulates hormones. It's a pituitary gland. The, the gland will stimulate and re, will re, produce and release certain hormones. Certain hormones like when you're in a fight, let's assume that you're in a fight or you are, you're trying to run away from danger. Adrenaline is the most is the most famous hormone. Adrenaline comes out. How does it come out? Through the this gland. The gland stimulates relevant hormones to help you manage the situation. Or they need to be released in order your body will function normally. Adrenaline is a hormone will be released. They say the body functions evenly through sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. So let's try to understand the meaning between the two. The sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. They say table one, effects of stimulation of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Effects of, 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 effect of stimulation of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system, they say, when you are in danger, when you in, in encounter a danger, they say, pupils of your eye dilate to let more light. They say, pupils of your eye dilate to let more light. When you are shocked by something, normally you can see your eyes, you are shocked. They enlarge. The pulse of your eye enlarge. Wow, what's happening? Instantly, structures in the lungs expand to absorb more oxygen. Structures in the lungs expand to absorb more oxygen because you're shocked. <gasps> you're shocked by something. Then, suddenly, heart pumps faster and blood pressure rises. Your heart pumps faster and blood pressure rises. More blood, as soon as you're as soon as your heart pumps faster and blood pressure rises, more blood reaches the muscles to increase the supply of oxygen and glucose. More blood, more blood reaches the muscles to increase the supply of oxygen and glucose. They work hand in hand. As soon as more oxygen is supplied and glucose through more blood reaches, they say less blood is available to the skin. Suddenly, less blood is available to the skin and digestive organs, so that more available, so that it is more available to the brain and skeletal muscle. They say, suddenly, less blood is available to the skin and digestive organs, so that more is available for the brain and skeletal muscle because you're in danger, meaning to protect your brain to protect your, your coordination. More blood in the brain, more skeletal muscle, and more blood in your skeletal muscle, meaning you are prepared to fight or run. Then digestive, digestion is inhibited. When I'm in danger, they say digestion is inhibited. Then this is an opposite. You see sympathetic nervous system, then you have parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system, they say, People contract to limit the amount of light that enters the eye. People contract to limit the amount of eye of light that enters the eye. It's vice versa, para. You can ask, let's say, they check this word from being paralyzed, meaning going down, or something that is dysfunction. Parasympathetic nervous system is an opposite of this. To see here, they say, purpose of the eye dilate to let the more light, here's an opposite. People of contract to limit the amount of light that enters the eye. Opaque muscle adjust. Now you're more relaxed. You can assume that the problem has been solved or it was a prank. Now you're more relaxed. They say there is a decrease in lung action. Whereas here they say structures in the lungs expand to absorb more oxygen. Here there's a decrease in lung action. You're more relaxed. The brain rate start to be smooth. There is a reduction of blood pressure and heart rate. There is a reduction of blood pressure and heart rate. Some muscles relaxes. Some muscle relaxes. Blood supply to the skin is restored. Whereas here, less blood is available to the skin. Instead, it goes to 
is less available to the skin and digestive organ. Instead, it goes to for the brain and skeletal muscles. Whereas here they say blood supply to the skin is restored. Blood supply to the skin is restored. Digestive process increases. Digestive process now increases. That's a relation between the two. The relation between sympathetic and parasympathetic. So I need to, to redo the slide, however, give you more examples, more the theory. Okay, the nervous system, first contact of information, nervous system. Under nervous system, we have what? Central nervous system as well as peripheral nervous system. They send the test book, the nervous system compromise comprises two main parts, the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is made up of the brain and spinal cord. It can be compared to the central control room. Central control room that sends and receives information to and from the body and the outside world. Then you have the peripheral. The peripheral nervous system is made up of the neurons and organs that lie outside or beyond the brain. They say they lie outside and beyond the brain. They're not connected. They lie outside and beyond the brain. We have somatic nervous system as well as autonomic nervous system. So let's start by the central nervous system. The central nervous system, they say, the brain and spinal cord are protected by bones. The brain and spinal cord are protected by bones. We'll get there. They are protected by bones. The brain and spinal cord are protected by bones. The skull is the, the brain is called protected by a skull, whereas the spinal cord is protected by vertebrae as well as three membranes. The three membranes, we have the outer membrane, middle membrane, as well as the inner membrane. The outer membrane, which is the dura mater which is very strong and thin, very strong and thin. The middle membrane is called arachnoid. Arachnoid, thick but more flexible. It's thick but more flexible. The inner membrane is called pyometer. This is a structure that I've given you. I, I've downloaded this structure. The outer membrane, which is the dura mater. This is the dura mater, which is an outer membrane. This is the top part of the brain, of the spinal cord, not the brain. Here they made an example. Imagine that you remove this blue spinal cord and you remain this yellow green spinal cord. This is the upper part. The upper part is a dura mater, which is very strong and thick to protect the movement. Why that the spinal cord, why is it protected? For the smooth movement. The spinal cord moves, you bend, you dance, you jump through the spinal. It gives you balance to stand up straight, to walk. However, it's not connected from bone to bone because there will be irritation or it will affect the nerves. Yes, we have membranes. Membranes, they, they protect the spinal cords not to attach to each other or they, they, they protect the nerves not to be squeezed by this bones to avoid irritation. Then the, the middle membrane, which is called arachnoid, is thick but more flexible. It's thick but more flexible. That is arachnoid, which is the second part. Then the inner membrane, which is soft and flexible. The inner is soft and flexible. Why is it soft and flexible? So that it won't affect the neurons. Remember, the neurons are tidy like structures, wires. They don't need to be to be squeezed or affected. Once the neuron is damaged, meaning for a you can record for me time it be damaged. The end of time, you need what surgery to repair certain structures in there. In the spinal cord. So spinal cord is the most sensitive part of the brain. When you get into a car accident, your spinal cord gets affected. It's either you will disable in certain parts of your body 
e.g. you might not walk again, you might not get an erection again. So it depends because certain nerves are being affected. You will ask yourself why is my spine is affected, however, erection is affected. Where does it connect? It means that certain important nerves have been damaged. So I hope you hear. Yeah. Then the nerves. Yeah, the nerves, spinal nerves and reflexes. We say information is received from the brain, it goes via the spinal cord. You see, this is a bone like structure, spinal cord. However, around the spinal cord, there are nerves. Wire like, you won't see them through a naked eye, unless you see a microscope or we do an operation. There are nerves around. Imagine this is a pole, electricity pole. Like I've said, electricity pole and there are wires that are connected to transport information from the brain to the spinal cord so that you can act the muscles. So there are nerves around, the neurons around. They say spinal nerves. The spinal nerve cord is made up of columns of white matter that is bunches of axons covered with myelin. If the axons are covered with myelin, you cover this last week, it means that information will move faster if they are covered by my myelin. Myelin is a fatty like substance that covers the neurons so that the information can move fast. If they are not covered, then the information moves slow. There are 30 pairs of nerves surrounding the spinal cord. 30 pairs of nerves surrounding the spinal cord. They say each nerve divides into what we call motor and sensory. Motor and sensory. So in short, sensory receives information. There is this responsibility to receive information from what? From the brain to the spinal cord. Sensory fibers carries the messages to the spinal cord, from the brain to the spinal cord. Then from the spinal cord, before the information, before you can act, it goes straight to what you call interneuron in the spinal cord. The interneuron in the spinal cord, which relates the message to the motor fiber. It doesn't go straight to two. the motor fiber, it relates the message to the motor fiber. Motor fiber sends message to the muscle to respond. Then automatically you act, you respond. You see something that is shocking, suddenly you jump. Meaning from your eyes, you see something, it goes straight to your brain. Sensor information takes that message to the to the motor fiber, motor, motor fiber, it tells you to jump, then you jump, but those are muscles. You become shocked, those are it's a muscle movement. This happens through reflexes, the process called reflexes, something that you cannot control. It's quick, happens in a quick succession. You see something that's shocking, suddenly you jump. You see a spider, suddenly you jump, meaning it's through reflexes. The spinal cord carries information to and from the body by produ producing basic forms of behavior. Those forms of behavior through reflexes, something that you cannot control. It, it's happen instinct, you are born like that. Instinctively, when you see danger, you become shocked. When you see someone that you love, butterflies in the stomach, we cannot control that. Your heart becomes warm because you love this person. Suddenly you smile internally or externally, you blush. A reflex is something beyond our control. They say a reflex is a simple stereotype response that follows immediately after a certain stimuli has been received. After a first stimuli has been received, you get your first kiss from a loved one. You get excited. They say it's a reflex is a simple stereotype response that follows immediately after a certain stimuli. So a stimuli in this case would be a kiss. Then you get excited. It's a reflexive, something that you cannot control because you are you, you are excited, you are excited. So muscle movement. So besides muscle movement, you have tendons. Tendons. Tendon, how you move. The spinal cord, they have tendons. There's a soft bone, or the either, yeah, they call it the, the, the softest bone, the tendons, to make the smooth movement, skeletal muscles, 
then it goes straight to the brain. The functions of the brain. A lot of functions of the brain, however, they, they serve different purposes. We have the, the lower brain, the forebrain, brain, mid brain, and hind brain. We have forebrain, brain, mid brain, and hind brain. Fore brain, we have what you call corpus callosum, thalamus, and hypothalamus. The mid brain is just this part. Hind brain, pons, cerebellum, medulla oblongata. So which part can you start with? Let's start with the top part. This time around, let's start with the hind brain. The hind brain, the medulla oblongata. This time I'll read from the study material. So give you a broad explanation of medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata is an extension of the spinal cord and consists of the gray matter cell bodies surrounded by the white matter nerve fiber. This is the medulla oblongata. They say the medulla oblongata is an extension of the spinal cord and the brain. Yes, it's an extension of, of the brain and the spinal cord, spinal cord, which is this bone. It's an act as an as, as extension. It consists of a gray matter. It's gray, consists of a gray matter, cell bodies surrounded by white nerve fibers. So the nerve fibers are white in color. It's surrounded by white nerve white fibers. Group of neurons in the medulla oblongata act as a re reflex center to process the survival needs. They say it's protects or survival. Medulla oblongata protects the survival, such as breathing and heart rate. When you watch the movies, most of the time when you watch movies or drama soapies, especially Chinese movies, karate movies, action movies, what they normally do is that, have you noticed, they use the, they use the back of the gun, then they hit you at the back of your neck. They normally hit you at the back of your neck, suddenly you collapse instantly. Either they use this object, mostly they use the back of the gun to hit you. Action movies, then you collapse instantly. Have you ever asked yourself, is, is this possible in real life? You hit someone at the back of the neck and suddenly collapse. So they are trying to show you that the back of the brain is close to the medial plongata. When they hit you at the back of the brain, the medial plongata meaning collapse instantly. That's where you faint. You know, you wake up after a few minutes. They are trying to show you that when your material from water can get a too much treasure through heat, through fist, through an object, you collapse instantly. Then they say it's a survival. It coordinates your survival material from water. They say on the front of the material from water, there are two bumps called pyridium. You won't see them? Yes. There are two pumps. At, in the front of the pedilo plongata, there are two pumps. You see these pumps? They call them pyridiums, formed by crossing the motor nerves, cracks that maintain brain contralateral control. So that is not important. I'm just explaining it. Before we confuse ourselves, let's go to pawns. Then we have pawns. These are pawns. The pons is a structure that acts as a bridge between the medulla oblongata and other parts of the brain. Here's the point. They say it acts as a bridge. It does not serve that much purpose. However, they say it acts as a bridge between other parts of the brain and the medulla oblongata. It's in the middle of the medulla oblongata and other parts of the brain. It acts as a bridge between the medulla and other parts. What else does it do? The pawns, they say, it regulates sleep and wakefulness. That's it. It regulates sleep and wakefulness. Straight to the point. Then we have what you call cerebellum. Cerebellum, where is the cerebellum here? Let's look at the cerebellum here. Some, they say, it's a small brain. Cerebellum is a small brain. That's what they call it. Look like, it looks like a, a brain, a small brain. Cerebellum, they say the main function of the cerebellum is to coordinate motor movement. It does, it does this by regulating your posture, 
balancing your muscle tone, muscle coordination. Remember, for you to, to move swiftly, to, to move with the balance, you need some coordination. They say posture, balance, muscle tone, muscle coordination. This happens through cerebellum. By integrating and, and comparing the information received from the body, it allows the necessary adjustment to be made so that the movement is initiated by the brain and carried out in a coordinated sequence. This means when you walk, someone calls call you from the back, suddenly you, you stop instantly, you go back. You are walking, suddenly the dog comes barking towards you. You're trying to protect yourself, either you run away or you move towards the dog. That is coordination, it tells you where to go. When you're moving, on, on the road, in the street, suddenly you see a, a hole, an object that you, that you can stop you or can trip you and fall. You try to avoid an object, you move swiftly to the left. That's through the cerebellum. It controls the motor coordination. Suddenly you want to run the cerebellum. I hope we clear. Then you are done with this. The hind brain. The brain, the, the sectum and segmentum. The sectum and segmentum pushes the middle brain contain two structures. Two structures that is they say the mid the mid brain is very a small part of the brain is actually continuation of the pons. It's a continuation of the pons. Very small part of the brain continuation of the pons. So you will find the tectum and a segmentum. Under sectum, the superior colicus, which a reflex center for controlling eye blink and the size of the people. The reflex center for controlling eye blink, eye blink and the size of the people. The inferior colicus, a reflex center of hearing by controlling volume, stuttery response sound. That is inferior colicus. Then segmentum, the ghost rate. Segmentum, I are mainly involved in regulating motor movement. Many involved in collecting motor movement. Then the last one, the last part of the brain, which falls under the forebrain. The major structures of the forebrain are thalamus, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, and limbic. What is the thalamus? The same thalamus consists of a, collect, a collection of nerve nuclei. Its main function is to Act as a relay station for sensory information. They act as a relay station for sensory information. What do you mean by sensory information? The incoming information. The incoming information which is received by the thalamus and sent to the appropriate structures, areas of the context of the brain. You receive the information. The information that says the knock. As we, are, as we are sitting right now, we are trying to we are attending to a class, the phone rings or the knock on the door. Knock, knock, knock. It goes straight to your mind. From your mind, it goes straight to the thalamus. The thalamus, it tells you that someone is knocking. Then you decide whether to attend to the door or not. Meaning the, the thalamus sends the information to the right, right places in your brain. The sound, the sound meaning with a auditory. Hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, they say the hypothalamus lies below, lies below the thalamus. Has many nerves nuclei that are involved in regulating what? They regulate, regulate the internal environment of the body, such as what? The temperature. We did mention temperature. They regulate the internal environment of your body, temperature, water intake, sexual activity. Heartbeat, blood pressure, and digestion. You'll see that in your, in your study material. The internal or the internal. Internal, they say temperature, the water intake, sexual activity, heartbeat, blood pressure, digestion. States, the state of sleep and wakefulness. Regulate the state of sleep and wakefulness. That is hypothalamus. So it's the key part of the brain. Then we have what? The basal ganglia. Basal ganglia. They say there are three large groups of neurons that regulate slow movement and smooth movement, like walking, smooth movement and walking. Axons 
from some of the neural objects to the motor area central nervous system, so that is not important. However, what is important is that consists of neurons that regulate walking. Walking is slow movement, not fast movement, slow movement. So the specific kind of basal ganglia, it regulates smooth movement, not quick movement. A smooth movement, that is just walking, basal ganglia. Then we have what we call limbic system comprised of structures like hippo, campus amalgaglia, septum, and limbic system that regulate motivated behavior. They regulate motivated behavior, emotions, as well as memory. Now they're giving us an example. What do they mean by limbic system in, in broader aspects? For example, the limbic system evaluates experiences as positive, rewarding, and negative, and disagreeable. Something that's positive, it has to do with and reward. Negative, meaning there are consequences, links the, this information to the memory and helps the person to adopt to similar situation that rise. Determines what is positive and what is negative, that's the limbic system. They say the hippocampus, the hippocampus plays an important role in the memory by comparing new incoming information with existing information. The Amal Gaga, they say, it links what is plays an important role through experience determining the fear and anger. So we'll check this in your, in your books. The function of hippocampus, Amal Gaga, septum, limbic system. Then I said to you, for you to remember this information, for you not to, not to confuse you, when you write your exam, you take notes of the similar terms, similar terms like emotion, it says regulates emotion, also limbic system, there's more emotion. That's how they're similar. You check points like movement. This, here they say walking, which is a smooth movement. Here regulates movement. They don't specify what type of movement, they just say movement. So the difference is here is just slow movement. That is working, regulates working. Here they say coordinate motor movement. Balance. You need to have balance when you work, when you run, is balance. So that's the difference between the three. Take cognizance of the differences. Hypothalamus, when you read through your recommended book and your study guide, they give you more, more more functions of the hypothalamus. You'll see that some of the functions in the hypothalamus are more similar to the medulla plongata. For instance, hypothalamus, they say, it regulates heartbeat. Also, this it regulates what heart rates. They are similar, heart, heart. You check the difference between medulla plongata as well as hypothalamus, because that's where you, you when you set your questions, you play around it to test your knowledge. Then what protects the, the brain? What protects the brain not to attach it to the skull? The start here, cerebral context in the outer layer of the brain. Cerebral context is an outer layer of the brain. It covers the brain. We can assume it's a membrane like or a plastic like that covers the brain. Remember, the brain is a soft organ, does not need any irritation. Cerebral context is an outside layer of the brain, which features bumps and grooves. You see the way it is, has bumps and grooves. Cerebral hemispheres are connected by the structure called corpus corazon. The two hemispheres, this is half of your brain, you see, it has been cut, half of your brain. There is another part of the brain, but they are connected by what? Corpus corazon. So corpus callosum is held as a bridge between the two brains. Corpus callosum, the left and the right hemisphere. We said the right hemisphere determines creativity, whereas the left hemisphere determines logical and rational thinking. As I give you a lesson right now, you are trying to apply your thinking. Perhaps you are writing notes. Perhaps you are integrating the information you are comparing from the recommended book, your notes, my notes that I prepared for you, perhaps you have question papers that are trying to answer the questions that you are, meaning you are using your left hemisphere, logical, rational thinking, 
Then right hemisphere is all about your creativity. When you take your notes, you have to do a, a mind map. That is creativity. You are trying to enhance your creativity, your creativity using color, colored pens. That's your creativity. Right hemisphere is creativity. Most artists are using their, their right hemisphere to write their songs, to design sculptures, sculptures. Then for protection purposes, the space between the skull and the brain is protected by what? The fluid. The fluid called cerebrospinal fluid, which is produced by the brain. What produces the cerebrospinal fluid is produced by the brain. It's also protected by blood barriers, the blood barriers. The blood barriers meaning, you know that, have you heard that if that a drop of blood can touch your brain, chances are for a particular moment you won't be normal. The blood does not need to touch the organ itself. Yes, they say blood barriers. There are blood barriers, meaning in between the brain, there are blood vessels that moves around. No blood is around the brain itself. However, there are blood vessels, the pipe like this, that transport blood for it to, to function, to transport oxygen for it to function. That it doesn't mean the play, your brain is covered by blood, no. There are blood barriers. It's more like pipes that facilitate the movement of blood and oxygen, called capillaries. Those capillaries which are important for many substances, they're important for many substances. They, they say they are impermeable to many substances. They allow oxygen and glucose in. They allow oxygen and glucose in. What goes out is carbon dioxide. They transport waste products out of the brain. They suck in oxygen and glucose. Waste products, they go out because the brain only needs oxygen and glucose for it to function effectively. They don't say water, they just say oxygen and glucose, meaning these are the two important substances that your brain needs. Waste food products, they go out instantly. We have how many four loops? Occipital loop, perirectal loop, temporal loop, and auditory loop. Occipital loop determines visual, what you see. Color, when you say visual, light determines light and darkness. You can differentiate light and darkness, someone in the distance. The, uh, the description of someone is true, occipital loop, whether it's fat, slim, Tall. That is true. The occipital loop. They say occipital loop lie at the back of the brain in the primary visual areas of in the context. That area, the area of which visual in, input is interpreted. If there is a tumor or cell growth that interferes the brain activity in the occipital loop, visual will be affected. If there's a tumor, in your brain, particularly in your occipital loop, then visual will be interrupted. If something hits you hard in your in your skull, and certain part of your brain is affected, and happens that you don't see clearly, meaning your occipital loop has been affected. I hope it's clear. Then the parietal loop. Parietal loop. They say determine the parietal loop body sensation. Body sensation. The five senses that is touch temperature. Here they because you are a psychology student, they try to twist it. Instead of touch, smelling, visual, and auditory, they use different concepts like touch, temperature, pressure, and pain. The parietal lobe receives inputs about this sensation and also information from muscles and joints, which has which tells the brain about the body position in space. For instance, I hit you right now, or you are not well in, in your body. You are not well. Let's say uh, you're experiencing what? Headache. You're experiencing headache. Your brain will tell you that you're experiencing headache. Which part of the brain will, de will determine that you're experiencing headache is parental because it's pain. You are hungry, it's parental body sensation. You want to go to the toilet, body sensation is parental loop. Mostly the internal. 
Then you have what you call temporal loops. The temporal loops, which are auditory, they say auditory area, the perception of sound, whether the sound is high or is low. When someone calls you, you can differentiate that Siabong is calling you, Samantha is calling you because of the voice, that is auditory. The song, your favorite song is playing, you start to dance, temporary loop. It happens through the temporary area, the auditory, the auditory area. Last one is frontal loop. One of the main functions of the temporary loops is the perception of sound. Is the perception of sound, mental activity and behavior. Okay, I'm reading wrong. The frontal lobe conserves the most frontal lobe mental activity, not sound. Frontal lobe mental activity and behavior. Behavior. This regulates the complex mental activity and behavior. What do they mean by mental activities? Let's check. It, the frontal lobe's function is more generalized were to produce integrated behavior. One of the main functions of frontal loop is to control voluntary movement. This says control voluntary movement. What do we mean by voluntary movement? Remember, something that is voluntary, something that you do willingly, something that you do deliberate. I give you notes right now. I give you an assessment to do. Study and you write it, meaning it's voluntary. Voluntary, you, you are hungry. Then you tell yourself, you know, I need to go and eat. Then you decide to, to do something for yourself, that is voluntary, meaning it's, it's regulated by what? The frontal loop. You are doing it deliberately, motor movement. You are allowing your body to work in order to achieve something. You decide to drive your car, it's not reflexive. When you drive your car, it's not more like reflexive. It's something that you do deliberately, voluntary. You drive your car, that's the frontal loop. They say it coordinates those type of movement. E.g., they say, the motor area of the frontal loop ensures the smooth performance of the sequence of motor skills that make up a complex action, like talking is part of motor movement, typing, playing tennis, playing games is part of your motor movement. And then they make an example, they say, if this part of the frontal loop is damaged, perhaps through car accident or something has injured you, it's the person makes Jackie unconditional movement and may struggle to to stop one movement and start another because your your now the important part of your brain is now affected meaning motor coordination will be affected. One important function of frontal lobe are paying attention, concentration, optimal arousal. Now that we are concentration meaning your frontal lobe place its role. In the last slide of today, the parental peripheral nervous system. We have somatic nervous system as well as autonomic nervous system. Somatic nervous system refers to the nerves that conduct information from sensory receptors in the body to central nervous system, sensory and afferent. Sensory, the receiving part. As we hear me right now, meaning you receive information through the sensory. Somatic nervous system refers to the nerves that conduct information from sensory receptors in the body to the central nervous system. Central nervous system which is your body and mind. Sensory afferent nerves from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscles in the body. Motor and afferent nerves. The autonomic then you have what the autonomic nervous system controls the process that regulates the internal organs. Internal organs, I mentioned that the most internal important organs here, lungs, and what? In the heart movement, those are the important internal organs that we're talking about. The glands, the glands that release specific hormones, whether in danger or you encounter something, so that the body functions evenly. There's a balance so that the body functions evenly. When they're too excited, they allows you to go down. When they are too angry, sympathetic and parasympathetic, parasympathetic makes you to loosen up. Effects of stimulation of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, they are opposite. There's para, paralyzed, sympa, excites. 
sympathetic nervous system versus parasympathetic nervous system. When you are in danger, they say, pupils of your eye dilate to let more light. You, you open your eyes, your pupils wider because you are shocked by something. That is sympathetic. But suddenly, if the danger goes away, people's, people's contract to limit the amount of light that enters your eye, optic muscle adjust. The amount of light it adjusts, that is parasympathetic. Under sympathetic, it goes more light enters. Under sympathetic, you see danger structures in the lungs expand to absorb more oxygen. Your lungs expand to absorb more oxygen. As soon as you are more relaxed, there's a decrease in lung action. There's a decrease in lung action. Less air goes in, meaning you're less anxious. Under sympathetic, the heart pumps faster and the blood pressure rises. The heart pumps faster, <laughs> the blood pressure rises. Whereas, on the other hand, the paralyzed, the parasympathetic, there is a reduction in blood pressure and heart rate. Sympathetic, more blood reaches the, the muscles to increase the supply of oxygen and glucose. More blood reaches the muscle and increase the supply of oxygen and the glucose to balance your body. Some muscle relaxes under parasympathetic. Sympathetic, less blood is available to the skin and digestive organs so that more is available for the brain and skeletal muscle. More is available to the brain and skeletal muscle. Blood supply to the skin is restored. Blood supply to the skin is restored. Sympathetic nervous system, digestion is inhibited. Digestion is inhibited. Digestive process is increased. So that's it for today. So most of this information I took from the recommended book and some from the study guide. I will explain anything under, everything under the structures and fashion of the brain. Human nervous system is a very important chapter for you to move on to sensation and perception, state of consciousness, intelligent emotion, learning and personality. You need to master the first chapter that is human nervous system. Human nervous system, when you study, don't try to mix up the information. First, do the nature of impulse conduction, then followed by the structures and fashion. Your, your question paper normally is 50 questions. And you'll find that 20 of your questions are based on your first chapter. Okay, you can lower then. Yes, the, another question. I know that our notes do not go into much detail. Do we need to know the details you have gone through today? You, okay, in that que uh, question, and however, what you need to do, you, you take these notes, these slides. Like Katrina has confirmed that the, it will send via the, the link. You take my notes, you take your notes, you take the study material, you compare. Also, the, it is important to use the past question papers and also the multiple choice question. Currently, you are doing your, you are doing your first semester, and your tutorial letter has got both first semester and second semester question. You, you compare. There's no need to go into detail if you don't know the structure and the questioning. So use the questions along with the study material. In that way, you will cover the most important aspects. So integrate the information, use all the information, then you will gather the most important aspects. My notes are detailed because I'm teaching you. They need to be detailed in order to get the whole information. Remember, not only you are preparing for an exam, but this is the beginning stages for you in, in order for you to complete your qualification to become a psychologist or a social worker you need this information <laughs> i hope i answered you same time it was nice having you and i hope the information will help you to pass the exam thanks very much <laughs>